Good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me yet, my name is Ron Levine from Mindfulness and Blue Jeans, and I've been practicing mindfulness and insight meditation for almost 25 years. And I started my practice during a time when I was dealing with clinical anxiety and depression and panic disorder. And my panic disorder had gotten bad enough it became agoraphobia. So I was trapped at home, I was on disability, and happened to get paired up with a psychologist who even back in the late 90s had been practicing and teaching mindfulness and insight meditation for several decades. And that was my beginning in this practice. I didn't think it would do anything. And here I am, a quarter of a century later, teaching, still practicing. And I'm glad to have you here with me today. Thank you for joining me. This is the next in our ongoing series of Calm, Calming Anxiety by Living Mindfully, as I share a lot of the techniques that I've used over the years, some that I'm just finding for myself now, some that I've discovered myself, some that others have shown me, as we all deal with this quirk of the human condition, this angst, anxiety, stress, suffering. So, today I'll be offering another technique, one that I've found effective over the years, and perhaps some of you will find it helpful as well. So let's go ahead and jump in, okay? As always, let's begin our practice by imagining that we are suspended from the ceiling by a piece of string attached to the tops of our heads, as a nice cue to sit up straight without adding any extra tension to do so. If you have brought some tension with you today, physical tension, mental tension, emotional tension, those are allowed. We're not here to force them away which usually involves bringing more tension to the tension that's already here in an attempt to get rid of tension. Doesn't make a lot of sense when we put it that way, right? So if there's some tension here, well, it's allowed to be here. It's uh, kind of what we came to see. So it's okay to just see that it's here. If you're not feeling any particular tension right now, same thing. That's what we came to see. There's a lack of tension here. It's less about what we find, more about the fact that we are finding it, seeing it, bringing some awareness to it, whatever it is. And if you haven't already, you may begin to bring your attention to your breathing. You may notice if your breathing changes when you bring your attention to it. It usually does. And sometimes we do it deliberately, thinking that we need some kind of a special breath for our practice, right? But we don't. Our meditative breath is the breath that's happening as we are meditating. And 
when we could see it however it is, just like with the tension I was mentioning. And perhaps one of the things that we see as it is, is that the breathing changes when we bring our attention to it, maybe if we don't even mean to, simply because it's very challenging to bring our attention to the breathing without then starting to shape or control it somehow. Sometimes it seems like it's our natural tendency to interfere. To try to fix things that maybe aren't even broken. And again, if that's something that we are seeing, even just with the breathing... It's okay to just see it. We don't have to then try to control our controlling, fix our fixing, right? That's just, that's a vicious cycle. That's a catch-22. It's about the seeing. Shining the light of awareness on the processes that are unfolding in front of us. including perhaps even watching the process of watching the process of things unfolding in front of us, right? The practice applies to itself. And one of the challenges that I notice for myself, particularly during times of anxiety, I notice that I start to see things with kind of a tunnel vision. I get hyper-focused on whatever it is that might be stirring up these feelings. I could feel it at a physical level, like I start tensing up around the eyes. But even at a A mental level. Sometimes when the crisis has passed, and I think back to what my mind state was like, what my thoughts were like, while I was in the throes of the anxiety... It actually looks like I'm looking at it through tunnel vision. Almost like I'm in this wide, expansive movie theater, but I'm just hyper-focused on just the screen itself. That's all I can see. It's like I've limited my field of awareness 
to this one tight little spot. And sometimes that's actually a part of this practice where we may focus our attention wholly on one particular area. But sometimes that's not so helpful. Sometimes we need to remember that we can expand that field of awareness there's actually a lot more going on than just what's on that little screen So if I can feel that tunnel vision starting to creep in, or even if I'm all the way in, I can bring some attention to that. bring the breathing to that. And I don't need to try to force some kind of expansion. I've found that it's enough to just allow the breathing to soften the edges. Soften the edges of that boundary, creating the, the tunnel vision. Again, we're not interfering. We're not trying to fix. We're allowing We're allowing the edges to soften, even just a little bit. You may feel as the breath moves in and out. Whether it's long or short, deep or shallow, however the breathing is, as it moves in and out. The edges around our field of vision whether it's a tight tunnel vision or something wider. Those edges are moving with the breathing.
And again, it's not something we have to force. In my experience, I've found that the edges <laughs> want to move. They don't particularly like being constricted. It's not pleasant. Sometimes it feels a little safer, right, when we close in on ourselves, trying to protect, right? But is that pleasant? Is that comfortable? And sometimes it may be necessary, but is it necessary right now? Is there an actual immediate threat here? Or are we just experiencing the perceived threat of the fact that there might be some threat here if we let our guard down? If we soften a little bit. That's when we're going to get caught off guard, right? That's when the threat's going to leap out. So we got to keep that guard up at all times. Maintain that tunnel vision. Just in case, right? So we don't get hurt. And so we stay in that mode perpetually. And what's that doing? Well, <laughs> hurting us. <laughs> We're so intent on making sure no one else can hurt us that we do the job ourselves instead. And then we wonder why we're our own worst enemy. So that's where this practice of softening the boundaries a little bit comes in. We just see, oh, hey, what happens? What happens if we loosen that grip a little bit, allow those boundaries to move a little bit, to breathe? I mean, if we don't like what we see, we can always tighten up again, you know, if we really want to. The option doesn't go away.
And as I mentioned, when I'm experiencing this kind of tunnel vision, it's not just at a mental level. I notice it at a physical level too, tensing up around the eyes and so forth. So you might bring some attention, some awareness, some breath energy, movement, loosening. the area around the eyes or the forehead. Sometimes I even notice I'm holding tension in my ears. Kind of pulling my ears back like a a threatened cat. As if that's going to actually protect me from any kind of threat, real or perceived. And just to be clear, when I'm talking about softening these boundaries, I'm not even talking about boundaries with other people. And that's a whole other topic. I'm just talking about our boundaries with ourselves. What are we restricting ourselves from? What are we blocking out about our own experience? By hyper-focusing on just one single aspect of it. And again, sometimes that's something we do actually do in this practice, is wholly focus on just the breathing. And sometimes that's extremely helpful. But if we find that we are wholly focused on one tiny aspect of our wide range of experience, and that one tiny part is riddled with anxiety, is that so helpful? Not in my experience. So how we decide to work with something depends on what it is we're working with. And ultimately, what it is that we're working with is ourselves, our experience, our experience of our experience.
So we want to build our skills of doing that in such a way that we are easing our stress and suffering rather than causing it. And using the breathing, our attention on the breathing, our focus on the breathing, and then directing that attention and focus and that breath energy to the boundaries that we are creating against ourselves in an attempt to feel safe and seeing, well, is this helpful? Is this actually helpful? And, well, let's find out what happens. Let's just see what happens. We give them some space to move. Mentally, physically, emotionally. This is a practice of asking the right questions, not knowing the answers in advance and asking the right questions. What happens? Well, let's see. Then based on what we see, we decide what to try next. And this is that skill building process. And in the process of building our skills, we're walking our path. Thank you, everyone. I'll hang on for a few moments if anyone would like to share or ask anything in the chat. Uh, from Chris, I notice holding tension in my teeth and jaw. Yeah, that resonates. <laughs> in the better part of about 20 years ago now, I ended up having to go to the dentist and some um, an orthodontist, some kind of specialist, to get fitted for uh, a night guard because I was grinding my teeth at night during a particularly stressful time. Yeah, that's that's a very common one. Yeah, the grinding, yeah. That's something I've really noticed. I mean, I'm well familiar at this point with my target areas for holding tension. You know, I feel it, like I say, definitely in the ears of all places. I don't know if that's a very common thing, but around the eyes, very much around the ears, Classic places like, you know, shoulders hunch up and, you know, of course, the stomach. I Stomach is something I'm working with all the time. It's like, okay, let's, as soon as something starts coming up and I'm feeling the, you know, some kind of stress coming up, usually the first thing I'll do is start checking the stomach because right there, it's one of the areas where we can actually feel the breathing and it becomes very obvious to me very quickly if there's some kind of tension if I'm holding something down there. So I'll usually start off by checking that and seeing, okay, how's the breathing doing over here? And again, not trying to force it in any particular way, just seeing, just seeing. Because I find if I'm trying to force the breathing down there, that just creates more tension. <laughs> you know, then I'm again, I'm trying to fix. And if I'm trying to fix, then I'm trying to make things be a certain way. And 
I'm never really satisfied with the way they are. You know, I never get it to a point where I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine now. You know, we, we don't get satisfied like that. It just continues on and on. Is it okay now? Is it okay now? Is it okay now? Is it okay now? And even if like I get to the point where it does feel okay for a minute, I'm still not going to stop. I'll come back a minute later. Well, how about now? Is it still okay? <laughs> so that's a large part of the reason why I practice and teach the way I do where I say, we don't have to control the breathing. <laughs> if we can just watch without trying to control and fix, it avoids that whole cycle of how about now, how about now, how about now? Because we're not looking for it to be a certain way. I always say this is a practice of seeing, not looking. We're not looking for things to be a certain way. We're seeing how they are. And that, again, ties in nicely to today's session where it's like, are we seeing everything that's actually in our available field of vision, whether it's physically or mentally, our mental field of vision, if you will? Or are we looking? Are we hyper-focused on this one little area? Are we having this tunnel vision. And the same way I'll start checking my stomach if I feel like there's something stressful coming up. Okay, what's going on? That's one of the other things I'll look for in the list. Is like, oh, okay. And it's not like a mental, like I have to think, okay, this and then this and then this. Like I'm just used to it at this point. I've been doing this for so long that I'll check the stomach and then I'll just kind of move up. Oh, okay, what's the shoulders doing? What's up with the ears? What's up with the... And then, okay, does it feel like I'm looking through like tunnel vision? Like I'm looking through binoculars backwards and just kind of check in and see, all right, what's this like? Where am I at? And in my experience, I don't have to... And this is, this is the real irony is I find I don't have to try to interfere and fix. That's the funny thing is the act of bringing the attention alone. Things just kind of start to turn around. It's like once our subconscious sees it and is like, oh, okay. Oh, look what's happening here. Oh, all right. It just starts to turn around seemingly on its own. And ironically, things end up moving in the right direction a lot faster and a lot easier than if I had tried to interfere and fix the way that we usually do. It's one of the hardest parts of this practice is being able to just see where we are getting in our own way and causing ourselves stress and suffering and just seeing it for a bit before we try to do anything about it. Just seeing it. What's this actually like? And getting to know it before we say, get out of here, leave, move, stop. Give it a minute. Just give it a minute and see. What is this actually like? And it's amazing the shifts that can come out of that seemingly on their own. It's really funny. If you ease up a little bit, things become easier. (laughs) It's an amazing thing. And I see it over and over and over again. Still have trouble with it myself sometimes, sure. Even after seeing it for so long. I think at some point I'll have seen it enough that uh, maybe it won't be an issue for me anymore. I won't be trying to jump in and fix. But I'm not there yet. All part of this human condition, right? Yeah, Amy, uh, hyper-focused. Exactly, yeah, that hyper focus. And again, in my panic days, because I was dealing with panic disorder unskillfully for almost a decade and was hyper focused and hyper vigilant about my breathing. So I was afraid, oh, if my breathing starts to get too quick, that's a sign of a possible panic attack, right? I can't have that. So I was very hyper vigilant, hyper focused on my breathing and trying to control my breathing, trying to fix my breathing, trying to interfere with my breathing, make sure it didn't get too fast. Right. And that actually ironically caused a shit ton of stress and suffering and didn't do a hell of a lot to stop the panic either. (laughs) So when I started this practice and was given the direction of, Hey, try not controlling the breathing scared the piss out of me. I was like, not control the breathing. 
maybe not control the breathing. Then I could have a panic attack as if I hadn't been causing myself panic attacks by trying to control the breathing all those years, right? Again, tunnel vision. I wasn't seeing clearly. I was so clouded by the anxiety and fear that I just kept shutting down further and further and further to the point that I couldn't see how little sense I was making. And so I did try practicing without controlling the breathing. And what a difference. Again, scary at first. But even the willingness to experience that anxiety was a huge step. It's like, oh, well, wait a minute. Not only can I actually let the breathing be as it is, I can even let the anxiety that arises around that be as it is. That was a holy shit moment. It's like, wait a minute. This can be here. This is definitely uncomfortable in many ways, but is not actually unsafe. I'm not actually in danger here. This can actually be here and be okay. Blew my mind. Blew my mind. Life-changing. And learning how to sit with that. Life-changing. Life-changing. And, uh, yeah, Ren here. I'm like that with the heartbeat. Yes. God, yes. If you looked at me spontaneously at any given time throughout most of the 1990s, you'd have seen me checking my heart with my hand. How fast is it going? Yeah. Absolutely. And as Chris is saying, yeah, uh, compounds the problem. That was one of the things that I discovered is that, yeah, the panic, my panic itself was not the problem. The problem was how I was dealing with the thought of panic. That's what was causing the panic. It was the ultimate vicious cycle. I was panicking because of panic. And once I opened up and loosened the boundaries, right? And once I loosened the boundaries a little bit and said, well, no, what's this actually like? It's like, oh, it still sucks. Still would prefer not to have this kind of experience, but it's observable. And it's not actually dangerous. Even though our body is telling us it is, right? I mean, panic attacks are basically kind of a quirk in the fight or flight system, right? Panic attack's not really going to help you in a fight or flight situation. It's not going to help you fight. It's not going to help you flee. You're just kind of, you know, you're having a, a meltdown, essentially. So even though our body is in this state where it's quite sure we're in mortal danger, and it's sending us those signals, are we? Not in terms of the panic attack itself. Panic attack's not going to kill you. So yeah, I was... As the Buddha would say, I was causing my own stress and suffering and doing a really good job at it. Really good job at it. And we have to see that, which is why we break out of this tunnel vision. See, well, wait a minute. Yes, there's an experience here. But if I'm hyper-focused just on the experience, I might be missing what I'm doing. That's setting the causes and conditions for this experience. What am I doing that is perpetuating this experience? And it's not until we begin to see those things that we can then start to step in and interfere, if you will, fix, right? Now that we have all the information, now that we have some clearer seeing, now we can step in and do something. Because this is an active practice. This isn't a passive practice. This is an active practice. So when I say it's enough to just bring attention and watch, not always. Sometimes that really is enough. Sometimes we do actually have to do something beyond that. But even in those situations, the attention, the awareness, 
the willingness to open up and really see what's going on. That still has to come first because how else are we going to do whatever we have to do next skillfully, effectively, without that information? So this kind of attention and awareness, this openness, this curiosity, always necessary. Always necessary. Uh, Ren, yes, the, back to the heartbeat. Sometimes I'm afraid to even walk up the stairs. Yeah, I experienced that. I experienced that. I didn't want to do things that would make the heart rate go too fast for fear that instead of slowing down afterwards, it would just continue getting faster and faster and, uh-oh, panic attack. Again, something that is observable. Observing the physical sensations. Observing what the mind does with the physical sensations. Breaking some of these components down. Sometimes it can be handy to do this focusing. And I say we're, we're widening the scope of our awareness. We don't necessarily have to then try to take everything in at once. To use the, the movie screen, movie theater metaphor, we don't necessarily have to try to take in the entire theater at once. Maybe we just, instead of just hypervigilantly focusing with tunnel vision on the movie screen, okay, we take that, and now, well, okay, we move over here and look at this thing, and then we move over here and look at this thing. We don't necessarily have to try to widen to take in everything all at once. We just notice, okay, maybe let's take our tunnel vision and just move it around a little bit. Chris, I have cardiac problems. Totally hear you. It loops. Yeah. Here's an interesting one for you. About three or four months ago, it's probably more now. No, about three, four, maybe four or five months ago, I started having, I forget which one it is, PVCs and PACs where your heart, um, it's not actually harmful, but it, it, you know, you feel like, oh shit, something's like really, really long here where your heart feels like it skips a beat and stuff. Went to the doctor and cardiologist and the whole thing. And they're like, no, you're actually okay as long as it's not happening ridiculously frequently, which for me for a little while it was. I got one of those little, um, you see the commercials for it around here now all the time. I think it's called like a cardia or something it's like this little doo that you put your fingers on. It measures your, your heart rate and stuff and got one of those things and was using it and was like, all right, what the hell's going on here? And What's really interesting is I have found, because I, I, you know, me being the way I am with, you know, this same way I am with this practice where it's like, okay, let's experiment with different things. Let's try and figure out what causes it and what doesn't cause it and how we're going to do it. And what I've actually found is the one thing, well, the, technically there's two things. I have found two things affect it more than anything else. One is just if I'm like, sitting but like in a reclined position if i'm in a deeply reclined position like in one of those easy chairs almost on my back it tends to increase it which is interesting but the thing that i have found the most and i just discovered this in the past month or so something i've been mentioning in these sessions and some of my other sessions elsewhere is that i've been doing a lot of work lately with my stomach and the reason for that is because i have found that like I say, I carry a lot of stress in my stomach. Like that's the first spot I tend to check because I notice that's where I'm clutching. You know, that's that's the first spot where I'm going to know at a physical level that I'm holding some tension is that I clutch my stomach. And I have found just in the last few weeks that if I really concentrate on relaxing the stomach, that almost entirely gets rid of the arrhythmia. I've had it go away for days at a time now, which a few months ago would have been unheard of because I was having I was having like those skipped heartbeat things like like every fourth heartbeat. So to go like even an hour at the time without it would have been amazing. And now I'm going like several days at a time sometimes and the only thing that what i finally narrowed it down to was oh just relaxing my stomach now 
Is that because there's actually some physical relationship between the stomach and the heart that's happening? Or is it because by relaxing the stomach, it's easing my overall stress level because I'm breaking that mind-body cycle? And that's ultimately, you know, couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you if it's a purely physical relationship or if it's more of a whole body stress thing. No idea. But after several months of troubleshooting myself and figuring out, okay, what works, what doesn't work, that is the one thing I found more effective than anything. And in a way is, again, kind of like checking those boundaries. Like if I'm hyper-focused up here, as I tend to be, I'm not catching what's going on elsewhere in the body. And this has been a pretty stark lesson in that. Karen, you had diagnosed the heart issue back in August. Yeah, so right around the time it was happening with me. It's scary, but told it's not a lethal condition. Yeah, there's um, PACs and PVCs. Um, premature ventricular contraction, I think it is. And then PACs, the premature atrial contraction. Basically the same thing, but with a different chamber in the heart. And they're quite common, especially on an intermittent basis. And I'd had them occasionally throughout my life, but not up, up until this past summer, never so constantly. And I was like, all right, what's going on here? So, yeah, I learned a lot about the heart this summer. Uh, and Linda, the vagus nerve. Good Lord, yeah, did I do a lot of reading on the vagus nerve. <laughs> Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of videos out on YouTube about all these different ways that you can stimulate the vagus nerve and so forth. And I was doing some of that stuff. I didn't find that all that effective, which isn't to say I was necessarily doing it right. And I wouldn't say I did any one of them consistently enough to maybe make a difference. So your mileage may vary. Nothing I've found for myself has been effective is just bringing attention to the stomach and easing that, and that seems to have done it. Um, Karen, uh, stop drinking alcohol. Yeah, alcohol is one of the things that can um, can have an effect. Yes, and that's just it. It's one of those things where it's like there's so many different things. So on the one hand, it's good. There's a lot you can try and work with. But on the other hand, it can be overwhelming. It's like, well, it could be friggin' anything. So we do what we can. Somehow this turned into a turned into a heart-centric episode of <laughs> calming anxiety by living mindfully. I'm not sure how this happened exactly, but anything goes here. Anything goes. Uh, oh, Chris, no, please uh, don't apologize. This is something that I know I'm not the only one, and Chris isn't the only one, and Ren's not the only one, you know? Like everything else that we talk about on here, this is stuff that so many of us experience, so I'm happy for anything that comes up in these because one of the oh, – Ren says there's actually a term called heart anxiety. That I did not know. I did not know that. That's interesting. Nothing that comes up – because what do we have? We have over 100 people in here right now, okay? There's over 100 people in here right now from, over, from all around the world, okay? And there's just no way – that anybody's going to bring up something in here that is somehow related to an experience of anxiety that at least 10 other people in here and probably a lot more than that are going to get something from and are going to resonate with and are going to be like, oh, holy shit, it's not just me? I'm not the only one? That more than anything is such a huge part of why we're here doing this right now. Say, hey, not only are we all experiencing some kind of shit, so many of us in here right now, people will never meet all around the world, never meet in person, aren't just experiencing shit, they're experiencing the same shit I am. It doesn't mean our experience is necessarily the same. But as the Buddha said, we're all experiencing stress and suffering. And the great irony is we all think we're the only ones. And we all think everyone else has their shit together. And we're the only ones who don't know what the hell we're doing. And you just got a bunch of people roaming around thinking, I'm the only one, I'm the only one, I'm the only one. 
And it's important that we come together and share our experiences of, oh, well, here's my shit and here's my shit and here's my shit. And this is how I'm feeling. Like, oh, wow. It's everyone. It's part of this human condition. We're just here being human together. As Becky says, that thought alone that we're all, that relieves my anxiety. Life isn't targeting any one of us and saying, all right, I'm going to screw with you today. We all get it. We all get it. I'm not saying some people don't get it worse than others. But no one gets through this life without stress and suffering. I mean, birth is a traumatic experience. The first thing that happens is a doctor spanks us, right? Makes us cry. So right out of the gate, literally, right? So we all experience stress and suffering. The question is, how do we handle it? How do we handle it skillfully? Right? That seems like a good note to go out on. Thank you all so much, everyone. Great to see you. Hope to see you again soon. Cheers.